Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who know me, hi, I'm Jonathan David Meller. And for those of you who don't, why not? Well, that's kind of why I'm here today, to talk about how we can be in touch with the people we need to be in touch with. And I know most of you are terrifically busy. I might not have time to, to watch the anecdotes of a, of a not very famous actor. So if at any time now or in the next few minutes you, you want to jump to the end, that's, that's fine by me. There's a, there's a button somewhere down here, a link that you can use to uh, jump to the end of this video and there you'll see the, um, the actual reason why I'm here talking, talking to you all today. So feel free to press that button anytime you want. And for those of you who are, are here with me today, well, I'll continue with my story. Who amongst us hasn't recently, at some point in the recent past, thought about how different life might be today for them and for everybody else if the technology we have today had existed in the past 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I'm sure we've all got examples of how technological advances have, have impacted our lives. Who remembers those clunky old typewriters that we used to type on with, with two fingers and the keys used to get stuck? And from there we went to the first, um, the first word processors that we had at home with with Coral, I think, who remembers Coral? Yeah, a few people here remember Coral. And then from there to desktop publishing printers at home. Um, and in the same vein, how many of us spent hours at school learning the correct way to craft an, an elegant, classically formed letter with dear sir and yours faithfully, and you had to get it all right. And we've gone from that to instant, uh, impersonal, cold emails. We've gone from um, post-its on, on the door. Oh you, you, oh, you left me a message, a post-it on the door. No, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. It must have fallen off. To, I sent you a WhatsApp. I've seen the two ticks in blue. I know you've seen my message, so don't try to tell me you haven't. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, and, and who knows where we would be or who we would be with if similar uh, advances in technology had existed by then. Think about that long distance relationship that we had over the phone with the overseas student that came to university for a year and that phone relationship cost an entire term's budget if our parents got the phone bill before the end of the holidays and found out, sorry, mom and dad, I'll, I'll pay you back eventually, I promise. <laughs> um, and so we've all got examples of, of how things have changed. And now these days kids have got their, their hang place and face space Skype time out. I don't know, all of that. It's all free. Kids today don't know how lucky they are. Now recently I started thinking about how, how these technological advances um, have affected my life and, and how my life would have been different if they'd existed back when I was starting out a career. Um, like, like many people in my, in my profession, I didn't start out as, as an actor. In fact, I was a, I was a teacher. And um, I, mean, I, love, I loved it, I still do love teaching, but there was one part of it that I was specifically not very good at, I'm sure there were many parts, but one part was the paperwork, the bureaucracy. And I happened to be a teacher in the UK at a time when consecutive governments seemed to think that um, teachers were just there to, 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 fill in, to fill in forms, not to teach, but to just do paperwork, to be, to be pen pushers. And when I say pen pushers, I mean Pens. We're talking about a time before Mr. Gates and Mr. Jobs revolutionised the world. So after a few years teaching, I decided it would probably be best if I got out of teaching, luckily for my students, I'm sure that's what they thought, uh, and, and pursue a dream that I had since I was, since I was a kid. Um, now, when I, I told my dad uh, that I was going to leave my first you know, proper job, he reacted uh, as many dads in the same sort of situation, uh, would react. Um, his first reaction was, why? What's happened? <laughs> and the second reaction was, an actor? Wait, is that a real job? <laughs> My mum, give her due, she was a little bit more, uh, a little bit more enthusiastic, actually, as all mums, unconditional support. Oh, 
darling, yes, marvelous. I remember when you played the, the third donkey in, in the school nativity play. You were marvelous. I was five. Um, oh, you, you'd be fabulous. You'd be an absolute success. Uh, the support of one's mums is like it's marvelous. Isn't it? Where would we leave it out then? So anyway, I, I headed to London to the, to the big smoke, the big lights, and pretty soon found myself in a big old mess, uh, struggling like almost every actor when he starts out, just to, to make ends meet, barely even being able to, to afford the rent on the not entirely legal lean-to that I was renting off the back of a house in North London. I can tell you're thinking, glamour, right? Yeah, this was not the plan. In fact, that was the problem. There, there wasn't a plan. I didn't, I didn't have a plan. And I, I started thinking how to, how to advance, how to get myself out of this situation. And then just out of the blue, uh, I, I remembered a, a university colleague of mine, a guy called Tom, Tom Aldridge. Um, Tom was special. While, while the rest of us were sort of struggling uh, to, to get to lectures on time and, 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 and write our essays and get our essays in on time and get to drama rehearsals or, or debate club or, or football practice or get to the bar, let's be honest, that happened as well. Tom was already imagining himself lifting uh, Golden Globes and BAFTAs and, and Oscars. He, I mean, he knew what he wanted out of life. Um, in, in fact, he'd already had printed out uh, his own sort of business cards. Um, and, that, and that was quite a big thing back then before the, before the technological revolution. And, and on the business card, it just, it just simply said, uh, Thomas Aldridge, uh, theatrical producer, and it, and it had his telephone number. Uh, he was in a, in a league of his own. He also had one of the very first mobile telephones that, that any of us had ever seen. It, it was one of those enormous things that looked like it had come from a, from a Second World War movie, but, you know, it was a mobile phone and one of the first. Um, so Tom, confident, connected, clued up. Um, and I thought if, if he continued in the, in the business, after, as, he, as he wanted to, as was his dream, after university, and he was still in the business now, maybe if I could track him down, it, it, you know, he could maybe give me some work, push some work my, my way. He was just the kind of person I needed. I, you know, wet behind the ears, head in the clouds, and totally clueless. The problem was, um, oh, we'd, lost, we'd lost touch. I mean, we'd, I, you know, it was only a few years after, after university, but, you know, you go your separate ways. If I could only, only find one of those, those business cards that, that Tom had printed. So I, I racked my brains trying to remember when it was he'd had them made. Because if I could work out what term it was, I'd be able to work out what books we were studying at the time. And maybe, just maybe, amongst the papers, there'd be one of his cards. Eventually, struggling through piles and papers. And I found, marking the page of uh, a medieval poem that I never finished translating for the essay I never finished writing, was one of Tom's business cards. Yay, this is it, this is it. So I called the number. It rings. Aldridge's fine meats and delicatessens, how can I help you? Um, uh, sorry, um, uh, I was looking for Tom Aldridge. Yes, Aldridge's fine meats and delicatessens, how can I help you? No, I'm sorry, I was looking for Tom Aldridge, theatrical entrepreneur. Oh, you mean my nephew has, has, has went off to, to Big Smog to make himself in the theatre? Oh, yes, he left me his mobile telephone. Grand it is. I use it all the time. I'll tell him you called. Bye. B, 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 B. <laughs> Early days of technology, people hadn't quite got the hang of it yet. I called back, left my number, and waited. Which actually just is a, just a good moment to pause. If you're short of time, folks, and you, you, know, you really want to jump to the end, now's a good time to call. So down here in the corner, I think we've still got the, uh, the link that you can click on. Uh, jump to the end of the story. You don't have to listen about me and Tom. And there we'll, we'll talk about keeping in touch and keeping in contact with people. So anyway, a few years went by. I didn't hear back from, from Tom mystical, mysterious, mythical Tom, who I'd built up in my mind as the, 
as the solution to all of my problems, the, the, the springboard for, for my fame and, and stardom. I, I, I was surviving. I was doing okay. You know, I was doing odd jobs, working in a bar here, looking after kids there, uh, you know, between acting jobs to, to make ends meet. And I've moved from the horrible, barely legal place that I was living in London to a horrible, slightly more legal place in, in South London, an altogether more salubrious form of hovel. Um, and of course, because I'd moved, my telephone number had changed before the times of telephones, mobile telephones. Um, and so, if, even if anybody had wanted to leave me a, a message or get hold of me, there was no way they could do that. Anyway, I continued with my life. And it was around about this time, uh, I was, one Saturday afternoon, towards the end of the summer holidays, I was in a, a shopping centre in the south of London. They're called malls now, but in those days they were called shopping centres, believe it or not. <laughs> And I was in the mall with my, with my goddaughters, aged five and three. And I'd been given the, the, the day's most important, the week's most important, the summer's most important job. And that was to buy new school shoes for the eldest of, of the two, five and three. Um, now, my, my best friends from, from university were the parents, are the parents of my goddaughters. And, um, and they knew. They knew that I never turned down an opportunity to spend some time with the girls. And they also knew how to milk that for all it was worth. So while they were at home, enjoying a quiet Saturday afternoon, uh, drinking Chardonnay or Chablis or whatever they were drinking, I'm being dragged around the mall by two very small girls. The, the youngest uh, demanding that I make the wheels and the bus go round and round on that machine for the 77th time and the eldest desperately trying to convince me that what mummy really meant w w was a pair of the, those pink sparkly shiny dance shoes the, those Nike Dash Superlift Van Air I don't know she was five how does she know these things anyway so we buy the shoes and we leave we leave the shoe shop and then I look down and I say to the eldest darling um where are, where are your shoes, your old shoes, the ones that you were wearing before, because she's totally barefoot? And she says, Mummy, I, uh, I put them in a box. Uh, uh, Mummy told me I always have to you know, tidy up after me. <laughs> Ringing any bells, folks? This is familiar. No. So, finally, with the right number of shoes and more or less the right number of kids, we head out of the shoe shop for the second time. And we're making our way towards the ice cream cart. Now the girls think it's a, a special treat for them. <laughs> it isn't. I need uh, a, a blood sugar injection pretty fast and I don't think they'd let me in the pub with two small ones in tow. So anyway, we're heading towards the, the, the ice cream van. And then, just as if, as if by magic, across the other side of the, of the mall, I see surrounded by kids and bags and, and books and new clothes and new stuff for school. Tom. Now, it, we were on the third floor of the, of the mall, the shopping centre, it's important to know. And so the, the big sort of hole in the middle and, and escalators going up and down and he's on, he's on the other side. So somehow I shout, Tom, and we managed to sort of communicate that we'll meet up. So that's what we're going to do. He goes one way. And I go the other way, and it looks like something out of the Keystone Cops or a Buster Keaton movie or something like that. Eventually, we stop, and we, we make it understood that by signals that despite our baggage, children and other kinds, we're going to meet over there by, by the guy dressed as a spicy frankfurter. How you communicate that in signals, don't ask me, but we managed, managed to do that. Tom, how are you? Have you John, mate, how have you been? Listen, hey, I saw you were in a show in, in town. I couldn't get to see it myself, mate. Sorry about that. I was in, in New York uh, promoting my new musical, Mice on Ice. Oh, so you're, you're still in the business? Yeah, yeah, loads of work. Got my own company, you know, West End, World Tours. Hey, we should get together. You tell me what you're up to. Critical moment. I said, this is it. This is the time. The problem is... Critical moment as well with the kids because two dads, well, honorary dad in my case at least for the day, frazzled, 
but you know, still wanting to make things work, being pulled in opposite directions by two pairs of small children. So we need to act fast. Okay, yeah, no, we must get together. So, uh, Tom, yeah, no, give me, give, me, give me a ring. Here's my card. Oh no, hang on, that's the old card, that's the old number. No, because we've got a new office in, in Broadway. Listen, mate, I've got to go. The, the, film, the film's starting. Listen, um, I, I, and, and, and he was gone. You know, di disappeared into the, the, the darkness of the cinema, uh, like, the, I don't know, like the, the baddie in the black hat hanging off the back of the stagecoach as it plunges over the cliff in a cloud of dust. Now, as I've mentioned before, I'm not the most organized of people when it comes to paperwork. Um, so, so the chances of me having anything like a pen or anything to write on, let alone being able to find them in that land of confusion, would have been pretty remote. But Tom, I mean, Mr. Transatlantic Theatrical Impresario, I, I, I've got to admit something here. I, I did feel a sort of twinge of schadenfreude, knowing that, that a man as organized, as together, as, as, as sorted as my mate Tom could be reduced to absolute chaos by nothing more than, than two small children and the threat of tears before bedtime if we don't see the start of Woody and Annie's adventures. In, in Toyland. So anyway, there he was, gone. For the second time in my life, the, the mysterious, mystical, marvellous Tom, who was going to be my, my springboard to fame and, and stardom, disappeared from my life. And I thought, at that moment, no. It, it shouldn't be like this. I'm a grown man, for goodness sake. So I decided, in that moment that I would emerge from the ice age of, of, of post-its stuck on the fridge door that fall off and never get seen, or, or of business cards that go into the, into the top pocket of the suit and never, never come back from the, from the cleaners. I was going to get myself organized. I was going to get my head out of the clouds and put it above the clouds. Which brings me, finally, to the reason that I'm, I'm here today talking to you. Now, I, I don't know where I would be if technology had been different and things had been different in my life. Who knows? Maybe I'd be living in L.A., starring in the latest uh, hit uh, sitcom series by my friend Tom Aldridge about uh, a disorganized but lovable English actor that goes to live in L.A. to star in a hit series about a lovable... But, yeah get the idea. Um, and who knows who I'd be with. My lovely overseas gets lovelier by every year that passes. Student, whose number do you have on speed dial? Not mine. But wouldn't it be so much better? Wouldn't it be marvellous if there were a way of having all our contacts in one place and, and they never went out of date, they never got lost, they never got misdirected. If we could have all our personal details, our phone number, our email, our social networks, even our resumes in one place, always up to date, automatically updating every time we made a change. Well, like I said, that's why I'm here today, to tell you about DigiCard and how that marvellous idea is in fact a reality. And if it doesn't seem to you all a marvellous idea, then, then I don't know, I, I promise to take your kids shoe shopping every Saturday that you want in the mall of your choice. <laughs> Just as long as there's ice cream. And seriously, you're going to call me. You need to call, click on the link, and you'll find out all about DG cards and the marvellous advantages the new digital interactive card can give you. So call. Call me. <laughs> Agents especially.